Synopsis of the Twelfth Tablet The soil dries, plains and river valleys are resettled. Plentiful gold comes from the lands beyond the seas. Anu and his spouse Antu arrive for a memorable visit. Reminiscing, the leaders realize they are destiny's pawns. They allocate three regions of civilization to mankind. Pardoned by the departing Anu, Marduk remains rebellious. The first region and space facilities are Enlilite lands. Man's first civilization begins in the first region, Sumer. Marduk usurps a site to build an illicit launch tower. Frustrated by the Enlilites, Marduk seizes the second region. He deposes and exiles Ningizida, Thoth, to distant lands. He declares himself Ra, supreme god, in a new religion. He introduces pharaonic reigns to mark a new civilization. Enlil assigns his son Ishkur to protect the metal sources. Inanna is granted dominion in the third region, Indus Valley. To come to earth one more time, Anu decided. With Antu his spouse he wished to come. While his arrival they awaited, the Anunnaki abodes in the Eden to reestablish began. From the mountain lands where descendants of Shem dwelt to the Odin land, the black-headed people migrated. Upon the newly dried soil, the Anunnaki let them settle, food for all to provide. Where Iridu, Inki's first city before the deluge had stood, on top of the myriads of mud and silt, a new Iridu was marked out. In its center, upon a raised platform, an abode for Inki and Ninki was built. House of the Lord, whose return is triumphant, it was called. With gold and silver and precious metals by Inky's sons provided it was adorned. Above, in a circle skyward pointing, the twelve constellations by their signs were marked out. Below, as in the Abzu, waters with swimming fishes flowed. In a sanctuary, a place that no uninvited can enter, Inky the Me formulas kept. For Enlil and Ninlil, a next Nibruki atop the mud and silt was established. Amid its people's dwellings and cattle folds and stalls, a sacred precinct was walled off. An abode for Enlil and Ninlil therein was built. In seven stages it arose. A stairway rising as to heaven to the topmost platform led. His tablets of destinies did Enlil there keep. With his weapons it was protected. The lifted eye that scans the lands, the lifted beam that penetrates all. In the courtyard, in its own enclosure, Enlil's fast-stepping skybird was kept. As the time for the arrival of Anu and Antu neared, for their stay in the Eden a new place was selected, neither Enlil's nor Inki's to be. Unuki, the delightful place it was named. Shade trees in it were planted. A pure white structure, the house of Anu, in its midst was built. Its exterior in seven stages rose, its interior like a king's quarter was. When the celestial chariot of Anu at earth arrived, Anunnaki skyships toward it soared. For a safe landing at the place of the chariots in the till moon, it was guided. Utu, the place's commander, his great-grandparents to planet earth welcomed. The three children of Anu, Enlil and Inki and Ninharzag stood there to greet them. They embraced and kissed. They laughed and cried. So long, so long has the separation been. They to each other kept saying, at each other they looked, aging to exa examine. Though greater in shars were the parents, younger than the children they looked. The two sons looked old and bearded. Ninharzag, once a beauty, was bent and wrinkled. All five of them with tears were filled. Tears of joy with sorrowed tears were mingled. In skyships were the guests and their hosts to the Eden taken. In a prepared place beside Unuki, the skyships landed. All the Anunnaki that on earth had stayed as an honor guard were standing. Hail and welcome, hail and welcome in unison to Anu and Antu they were shouting. Then, in a procession, singing and music playing, the Anunnaki to the house of Anu the guest accompanied. In the house of Anu, Anu washed and rested, then he was perfumed and clothed. Antu by female Anunnaki to the house of the golden bed was escorted. 
There she too washed and rested, then she was perfumed and clothed. In the open courtyard, as an evening breeze, the tree's leaves rustled. Anu and Antu on thrones were seated. Flanking them were Enlil and Inki and Ninharzag. Attendants, earthlings who were completely naked, wine and good oil served. Others in a corner of the courtyard, a bull and a ram, gifts of Enlil and Inki on a fire were roasting. A great banquet was for Anu and Antu prepared, for the sign in the heavens its start was awaiting. On Enlil's instructions, Zimul, who in matters of stars and planets was learned, the steps of the house of Anu ascended, the rising of the planets at eve time to announce. On the first step, Kishar in the eastern skies appeared. Lahamu, or the second step, was seen. Mamu on the third step was announced. Anshar by the fourth step rose. Lamu on the fifth step was seen. The moon from the sixth step was announced. Then, on a signal from Zamul, the hymn, the planet of Anu in the sky, rises, began to be sung. For from the topmost step, the seventh, the red-haloed Nibiru into view came. To music, the Anunnaki clapped and danced. To music, they danced and sang. To the one who grows bright, the heavenly planet of the Lord Anu, they sang. On the signal, a bonfire was lit, seen from place to place where the bonfire started. Before the night was over, the whole land of Eden was with bonfires lit. After a meal of bull meat and ram meat of fish and fowl with wine and beer accompanied, Anu and Antu to their overnight quarters were accompanied. By Anu and Antu were all the Anunnaki thanked. For several earth days and nights, Anu and Antu slept. On the sixth day, his two sons and daughter, Anu, summoned. Of what had on earth transpired their accounts he heard, of the peace and the warfare he learned, of how the earthlings, by the oath of Enlil to be wiped off, had again proliferated Anu heard, of the gold discovery in the land beyond the oceans and the chariots placed there, Enlil to him revealed. It was then that of the dream and the tablet from Galzu Inki to his father told. By that was Anu greatly puzzled, a secret emissary by that name, to earth by me was never sent. So did Anu to the three leaders say. Puzzled were Inki and Enlil, baffled they at each other looked. On account of Galzu, Zazudra and the seed of life were saved, Inki said. On account of Galzu, on earth we remained, Enlil to his father said. The day to Nibiru you return, you shall die, so did Galzu to us say. Incredulous of that was Anu. The change of cycles indeed havoc did cause, but with elixirs cured it was. Whose emissary, if not yours, was Galzu, Inki, and Enlil in unison said? Who the earthlings to save wanted, who on earth made us stay? Ninharzag, her head slowly nodded, for the creator of all did Galzu appear. Was the creation of the earthlings also destined? Of that I must wonder. For a while the four of them were silent, each one past events in his heart recounted. While fates we decreed, the hand of destiny every step directed, so did Anu say. The will of the creator of all is clear to see. On earth, and for earthlings, only emissaries we are. The earth to the earthlings belongs. To preserve and advance them we were intended. If that is our mission here, let us accordingly act, so did Inki say. The great Anunnaki who the fates decree councils exchanged regarding the lands to create civilized regions the great Anunnaki decided therein knowledge to mankind provide. Cities of man to establish therein sacred precincts abodes for the Anunnaki create. Kingship as on Nibiru on earth establish crown and scepter to a chosen man give. By him the word of the Anunnaki to the people convey work and dexterity to enforce. In the sacred precincts a priesthood to establish the Anunnaki as lofty lords to serve and worship. Secret knowledge to be taught, civilization to mankind convey. To create four regions, three for mankind, one restricted the Anunnaki resolved. The first region in the olden Eden land to establish for Enlil and his sons to dominate. The second region in the land of the two narrows thereafter to follow, for Inki and his sons to lord. 
the third region, with the other two not mingling in a distant land to Inanna Grant. The fourth region, for the Anunnaki alone consecrated, the peninsula of the place of the chariots will be. Now, this is the account of Anu's journey to the lands beyond the oceans, and how in the first region for the Anunnaki cities were re-established. Having the decision about the four region in mankind's civilizations made, Anu, about his grandson Marduk, inquired, I must see him again to the leaders, Anu said. Whether by Dumuzi and Ningazita to Nibiru inviting, Marduk's ire I myself have caused. So did Anu wonder to reconsider the punishment of Marduk he wished. When to the lands beyond the oceans you journey, Marduk to meet you will be told. The land where he roams, in those parts of the earth it is, so did Enlil to Anu say. Before the distant lands the royal couple went, the Eden and its lands Anu and Antu surveyed, Iridu and Nibruki they visited, where the cities of the first region were planned they saw. In Iridu Enlil about Inki complained, the me formulas to himself Inki is keeping. Anu on the seat of honor seated, words of praise to Inki said, my son, for himself a magnificent house built, beautifully on a platform it is raised. To the people that the house surround and serve, great knowledge will Inki give. Now the knowledge that in the Mies is secreted with other Anunnaki must be shared. Embarrassed was Inki to share with all the divine formulas to Anu, he promised. In the ensuing days, in skyships traveling, Anu and Antu, the other regions, surveyed. Then. On the seventeenth day, to Anuki, the royal couple returned for one more night of rest. In the morrow, when the younger Anunnaki before Anu and Antu for a blessing came, Anu to his great-granddaughter Inanna took a liking. He drew her closely, he hugged her, and kissed her. Let all my words heed to the con congregated he announced. This place after we leave to Inanna as a dowry is given. Let the sky ship in which we the earth shall survey to Inanna my present be. Joyed Inanna to dance and sing began, her praises of Anu as hymns in times to come were chanted. Thereafter, binding farewells to the Anunnaki, for the lands beyond the oceans Anu and Antu departed. Enlil and Inki and Ninurta and Ishkur with them to the Golden Land went. To impress Anu the king with the great golden riches, Ninurta an abode for Anu and Antu built, its stone blocks to perfection cut, with pure gold inside were covered. A golden enclosure with flowers of carnelian stones carved, the royal couple awaited. By the shore of the great mountain lake was the abode erected. How the gold nuggets are collected, the visitors were shown. There is gold here enough for many shards to come, Anu satisfied said. To a place nearby, Ninurta to An Anu and Antu, an artificed mound showed. How to place for melting and refining metals it was made, Ninurta explained. How a new metal from stones was extracted, he showed them. A knock. Anunnaki made, he called it. How by combining it with the abundant copper and strong metal he invented, he showed them. On the great lake, from whose shores the metals came, Anu and Antu sailed. The Lake of Anak, Anu called it. Henceforth, this was its name. Then, from lands from the north, lands where great horned beasts are hunted, Marduk before his father Inki and his grandfather Anu came. Nabu, his son, with him was. When Inki about Sarapanit inquired, Marduk with sorrow of her death them told. Now, Nabu alone with me has remained, to his father and grandfather Marduk said. Anu, Marduk to his chest pressed. Enough, you have been punished to him, he said. With his right hand on Marduk's head, Anu, Marduk to be forgiven, blessed. From the golden place high in the mountains, all who had gathered to the plain below went. There, stretching to the horizon, Ninurta, a new place for the chariots, has prepared. Anu, and Antu's celestial chariot stood there ready, with gold to the brim it was loaded. As the time for departing came, Anu to his children words of goodbye and guidance said, Whatever destiny for the earth and the earthlings intended, let it so be. If man, 
not Anunnaki to inherit the earth is destined, let us destiny help. Give mankind knowledge, up to a measure secrets of heaven and earth them teach. Laws of justice and righteousness teach them, then depart and leave. So did Anu to his children fatherly instructions give. Once more they hugged, embraced, and kissed, and from the new chariot's place Anu and Antu for Nibiru left. The first to break the sorrowed silence was Marduk, with anger were his words. What is this new place of celestial chariots, of the others an explanation he demanded? What after my exile without my knowledge has transpired? When Inki of the decisions about the four regions to Marduk told, Marduk's fury knew no bounds. Why will Inanna, a cause of Demuzi's death, her own region get? The decisions have been made. They cannot be altered. So did Enlil to Marduk say. In separate sky ships to the Eden and its adjoining lands they returned. Sensing trouble, Enlil Ishkur to stay behind instructed, over the gold watch to keep. To commemorate Anu's visit, a new count of time passage was introduced. By earth years, not by Nibiru Shars, was what on earth transpired to be counted. In the age of the bull to Enlil dedicated was the count of earth years begun. When to the Eden the leaders returned, the place of the first civilized region, how to make bricks from mud, the Anunnaki the earthlings taught, therewith cities to build. But where once cities of the Anunnaki alone had stood, cities for both them and earthlings now arose. Therein and in new cities for the great Anunnaki, sacred precincts were consecrated. Therein the Anunnaki with lofty abodes were provided, temples by mankind they were called. Therein the Anunnaki as lofty lords were served and worshipped. By number ranks were they honored, the airship to mankind made known. Anu, the heavenly, the rank of sixty held, to Enlil the fifty rank was given. On Ninurta his forehead, his foremost son did Enlil the same rank bestow. Next in succession was the Lord Inki, the rank of forty he held. To Nanar, the son of Enlil and Ninlil, the rank of thirty was assigned. To his son and successor Utu, the rank of twenty was allotted. Ten as a number rank to the other Anunnaki leader sons was granted. Ranks by the fives between the female Anunnaki and spouses were shared. When after Iridu and Nibruki and their temple abodes were completed, in Lagash the Gursu precinct for Ninurta was built, his black sky bird there was kept. Inanu, house of fifty, was the temple abode for Ninurta, and Bao, his spouse, called. The supreme hunter and the supreme smiter weapons, a gift to Anu, the Inanu protected. Where Sippur before the deluge had been, on top of the mud soil, Utu, a new Sippur, established. In the Ebabar, the shining house, an abode for Utu and his spouse, Ayo, was raised. From there, Utu, for mankind, laws of justice promulgated. Where, because of silt mud, the olden plans could not be followed, new sites were chosen. A dab, a site from Shurabak not distant, for Ninharzag, as a new center was made. The house of succor and healing knowledge was her temple abode therein named. The Mies, of how the earthlings were fashioned, Ninharzag in its holy shrine kept. For Nanar, a city with straight streets, canals, and wharves was provided. Urum was its name. House of the Throne's seed was its temple abode called, the moon's beams to the lands it reflected. Ishkur to the mountain lands of the north returned, the house of seven storms his abode was called. Inanna in Unuki resided, in the abode by Anu bequeathed to her she dwelt. Marduk and Nabu in Iridu dwelt, in the Eden their own abodes they did not have. Now this is the account of the first city of men, and of kingship on earth, and how Marduk to build a tower schemed, and wherefore Inanna the Mees stole. In the first region, in the lands of Eden, and in the cities with precincts, by their Anunnaki lords the earthlings' handiworks and crafts were taught. Before long were the fields irrigated, on canal and river boats soon sailed. The sheepfolds and granaries were overflowing, 
prosperity the land filled. Kiangi, land of the lofty watchers, the first region was called. Then, to let the black-headed people a city of their own possess, it was decided. Kishi, Scepter City, Scepter City, it was called, and Kishi did the kingship of man begin. Therein, in consecrated soil, Anu and Enlil, the heavenly bright object, implanted. In it, Ninurta, the first king appointed, mighty man was his royal title. To make it a center for civilized man, Ninurta to Iridu journeyed. The Mi tablets that for kingship define formulas hold from Inki to obtain. Properly attired with respect, Ninurta Iridu entered. For the Mi of kingship he asked. Inki, the lord who all the Mi's safeguards, fifty Mi to Ninurta granted. In Kishi, where the black-headed people with numbers to calculate taught, heavenly Nasaba writing them taught, heavenly Ninkashi beer-making them showed, in Kishi by Ninurta guided, kiln work and smithing proliferated. Wheeled wagons to male asses harnessed, craftily in Kishi first were fashioned. Laws of justice and righteous behavior in Kishi were promulgated. It was in Kishi that the people's hymns of praise to Ninurta composed. Of his heroic deeds and victories they sang, of his awe-inspiring black bird they chanted. How in faraway lands the bisons he subdued, how the white metal to mix with copper he found. Ninurta's glorious time it was, with the constellation of the archer he was honored. All the while Inanna, in Anuki, her lordship in the third region awaited. All the while the domain of her own of the leaders she demanded. The third region after the second one will come, her leaders thus assured her. Having seen how Ninurta to Iridu journeyed, how the me of kingship he obtained, Inanna in her heart a plan devised, to obtain me from Inki she schemed. Her chambermaid, Ninshabur, to Iridu she dispatched, a visit by Inanna to announce. On this hearing Inki to Izumud, his housemaster quickly instructions gave, The maiden, all alone, to my city Iridu her step is directing. When all alone she will arrive, my inner chambers let her enter. Pour for her cold water to freshen her heart, barley cakes with butter give her. Sweet wine prepare, the beer vessels to the rim fill up. When Inanna alone the abode of Inki entered, Izumud, Inki's commands followed. Then when Inki Inanna greeted by Inanna's beauty he was overwhelmed. With jewelry was Inanna bedecked. By her thin dress her body she revealed. When she bent down, her vulva by Inky was thoroughly admired. From the wine cup sweet wine they drank, for beer drinking a competition they had. Show me the me's, Inanna to Inky playfully said. Let me, me in my hand hold. Seven times in the course of the competition Inky to Inanna's me's to hold gave. The divine formulas for lordship and kingship for priesthood and scribeship. For love dressing and for warring, me's to Inanna Inky to hold gave. For music and singing, woodworking and metals and precious stones, ninety four me's that for civilized kingdoms are needed, Inky to Inanna gave. Holding her prizes tightly, Inanna from the slumbering Inky slipped away. To her boat of heaven she rushed out to soar away her pilot she instructed. When Inky from his slumber by Izumud was awakened, Get hold of Inanna to Izumud, he said. When from Izumud that Inanna had already in her boat of heaven departed Inki heard, to chase Inanna in Inki's skyship Izumud he instructed. All the me's you must retrieve to him, he said. At the approach to Unuki, in Izumud, Inanna's boat of heaven intercepted. To return to Iridu and the wrath of Inki face he made her. When Inanna back to Iridu was brought, the Mees with her no more were. To her chambermaid, Ninshubur, she gave them. To the house of Anu in Unuki, Ninshubur took them. In the name of my power, in the name of my father Anu, I command you the Mees to return. So did Inki angrily to Inanna say, in his abode captive he held her. When of this Enlil heard, to Iridu to face his brother he came. 
By right the Mees have I obtained, Inky himself in my hand placed them. So did Anna, in Anna to Enlil say, the truth of that Inky meekly admitted. When the time term of Kishi shall be completed, to Anuki the kingship shall pass, so did Enlil declare. When Marduk all this did hear, greatly he was enraged, his anger no bounds knew. Enough has my humiliation been to his father Inki, Marduk shouted. A sacred city of his own in the Eden from Enlil he forthwith demanded. When Enlil to Marduk's appeal no heed paid, Marduk fate in his own hands grasped. To a place that for Anu's arrival before Anuki was selected was considered, Nabu, the Agigi and their offspring from their dispersal lands summoned, for Marduk therein a sacred city, a place for sky ships to establish. When his followers at the place assembled, stones to build with they found not. Marduk how to make bricks and burn them by fire to serve as stone to them he showed. Therewith a tower whose head the heavens can reach they were building. To thwart the plan, Enlil to the place hurried, to placate Marduk with soothing words he tried. To stop Marduk and Nabu in their endeavor, Enlil did not succeed. In Nibruki, Enlil, his sons and grandchildren assembled. What to do they all considered. Marduk, an unpermitted gateway to heaven is building, to earthlands it he is entrusting. So did Enlil to his sons and grandchildren say. If this we allow to happen, no other matter of mankind shall be unreached. This evil plan must be stopped, Ninurta said. All with that agreed. It was night time when from Nibruki the Enlilite Anunnaki came. From their sky ships havoc upon the rising tower, fire and brimstones they rained. To the tower and the whole encampment a complete end they made. To scatter abroad the leader and his followers, Enlil thereupon decided. Henceforth, their counsels to confuse, their unity to shatter, Enlil decreed. Until now, all the earthlings one language had, in a single tongue they speak. Henceforth, their language I shall confound, that they each other's speech will not understand. In the three hundred and tenth year since the count of earth years began, did this all happen. In each region and every land the people a different tongue he made to speak. A different form of writing thereafter to each was given, that one the other will not comprehend. Twenty-three kings did in Kishi reign, for four hundred and eight years was it the scepter city. It was also in Kishi that a beloved king, Itana, for a heavenly journey was taken. At the allotted time, let kingship to Anuki be transferred, so did Enlil decree. To its soil, the heavenly bright object from Kishi was transferred. When the decision to the people was announced, to Inanna an exaltation hymn they sang. Lady of the Mees, queen, brightly resplendent, righteous in radiance clothed of heaven and earth beloved. By the love of Anu consecrated, great adorations wearing, seven times the Mees she obtained, in her hand she them is holding. For the tiara of kingship they are appropriate, for high priesthood suitable. Lady of the great Mees, of them she is the guardian. In the four hundred and ninth year after the count of earth years began, kingship of the first region to Anuki was transferred. Its first king was the high priest of Iana, temple abode, a son of Utu he was. As for Marduk, to the land of the two narrows he went. To be the master of the second region, once established, he expected. Now, this is the account of how the second and third regions were established, and how Ningazita was exiled and Unuki Arata threatened. When Marduk, after a long absence to the land of the two narrows, returned, Ningazita as its master he there found, its lofty lord Ningazita was. With the aid of offspring of Anunnaki who earthlings espoused did Ningazita the lands oversee, what Marduk had once planned and instructed by Ningazita was overturned. What is this that happened, Marduk of Ningazita to know demanded? Of the destruction of hidden things Marduk Ningazita accused, of making Haran to a desert place depart, a place that has no water, a boundless place where sexual pleasures are not enjoyed. 
the two brothers an uproar made, upon quarreling bitterly they embarked. Pay heed, I am here in my proper place, Marduk to Ningazita said. You have been my place taker, from now on only a deputy of mine you can be. But if to rebellion you are inclined, to another land go away you must. For three hundred and fifty earth years did the brothers in the land of the two narrows quarrel. For three hundred and fifty years was the land in chaos, between the brothers it was split. Then Inki, their father, to Ningazita said, For the sake of peace, to the other lands depart. To go to a land beyond the oceans Ningazita chose. With a band of followers, thereto he went. Six hundred and fifty earth years was at that time the count. But in the new domain where Ningazita the winged serpent was called, a new count of its own began. In the land of the two narrows, the second region under Marduk's lordship was established. In the annals of the first region, Magan, land of the cascading river, it was called. But by the second region's people, when languages were confounded, Himta, the dark brown land, it was henceforth called. Netaru, guardian watchers, the Anunnaki, were there in the new language called. Marduk, as Ra, the bright one, was worshipped. Inki, as Ptah, the developer, was venerated. Ningazita, as Tehuti, the divine measurer, was recalled. To erase his memory, Ra, on the stone lion, his image with that of his son, Asar, replaced. To count by tens, not by sixty, Ra the people made. The year he also by tens divided. The watching of the moon by the watching of the sun he replaced. Whereas under the lordship of Tehuti, the olden city of the north and the city of the south were re-established. Marduk slash Ra, the two lands of the north and of the south into one crown city united. A king, an offspring of Neturu, an earthling, he there appointed. Mina was his name. Where the two lands meet and the great rivers divides, a scepter city Ra established. Splendor to surpass Kishi in the first region he gave it. Mena Nefer, Mena's beauty it was called. To honor his elders Ra a holy city built to honor Nibiru's king Anu he named it. Therein on a platform a temple abode for his father Inki Ptah he erected. Its head, within a high tower, like a sharp rocket skyward rose. In its shrine, Ra, the upper part of his celestial barge, deposited, Ben-Ben, it was called. It was the one in which, from the planet of countless years, he had traveled. On the day of the new year, the king, as high priest, the ceremonies performed. On that day, only alone, the innermost star room he entered, before the Ben-Ben offerings he put. To benefit the second region, Ptah, to Ra, all manner of Mies gave. What do I know that you do not know? The father his son asked. Then all manner of knowledge except that of the dead reviving to Ra he gave. As a great one of the twelve celestials, Ptah to Ra, the constellation sign of the ram allotted. The water flow of Hapi, the land's great river, Ptah for Ra and his people regulated. Abundance in the fertile soils quickly came, man and cattle proliferated. By the success of the second region, the leaders were encouraged. The third region to establish, they proceeded. To make it a domain of Inanna, as she was promised, they decreed. As befits the mistress of a region, a celestial constellation to her was assigned. Beforehand, with her brother Utu, the station of the twins she shared. Henceforth, as a gift from Ninharzag, her constellation of the maiden to Inanna was allotted. In the 860th year, according to Earth's year count, was Inanna so honored. Far away in the eastern lands beyond seven mountain ranges was the third region. Samush, land of sixty precious stones, was its highland realm called. Arata, the wooden realm, was in the valley of a meandering great river located. In the great plain did the people cultivate crops of grains and horned cattle herd. There, two cities with mud bricks they built, with granaries they were filled. As by Enlil's decree required the Lord Inki, Lord of Wisdom, for the third region a changed tongue devised, a new kind of writing signs he for it fashioned. A tongue of man, heretofore unknown, for Arata, Inki in his wisdom created. But the Mies of civilized kingdoms for the third region 
Inki did not give. Let Inanna, what for Unuki, had obtained with the new region share, so did Inki declare. In Arata, Inanna, a shepherd chief appointed, akin to her beloved Demuzi he was. In her skyship from Unuki to Arata, Inanna journeyed over mountains and valleys she flew. The precious stones of Samush she cherished, pure lapis lazuli with her to Unuki she carried. At that time, the king in Anuki was in Merkar, the second one to reign there in he, he was. It was he who the boundaries of Anuki expanded by its glories was Inanna exalted. It was he who the wealth of Arata co coveted to be over Arata supreme he schemed. To Arata in Merkar, an emissary dispatched as a tribute Arata's riches to demand. Over seven mountain ranges through parched lands and then soaked by rains, the emissary to Arata went. To the king of Arata, the demand words of Inmerkar, word for word, he repeated. His language, the king of Arata, to understand was unable. Like the bray of a donkey, its sound was. A wooden scepter inscribed with a message the king of Arata to the emissary gave. To share Anuki's mees with Arata, the king's message requested. As a royal gift to Anuki, grains on donkeys were loaded. With the emissary to Anuki, they went. When in Murkar, the inscribed scepter received its message in Anuki, no one understood. He brought it forth from light to shade. He brought it forth from shade to light. What kind of wood is this, he asked. Then to plant it in the garden, he ordered. After five years, after ten years had passed, from the scepter a tree grew. A tree of shade it was. What shall I do, in Merkar, in frustration, his grandfather Utu asked. With heavenly Ninsaba, the mistress of scribes and writing, Utu interceded. On a clay tablet, his message to inscribe Ninsaba, in Merkar, taught, in the tongue of Arata it was. By the hand of his son Banta, was the message delivered. Submission or war, it said. By Inata, Inanna, Arata was not abandoned. To Anuki, Arata will not submit, the king of Arata said. If warfare Anuki desires, let one warrior, one warrior in combat meet. Better yet, let us peacefully treasures exchange. Let Anuki its mees for Arata's riches give. On the way back, carrying the peace message, Banta fell sick. His spirit left him. His comrades raised his neck without the breath of life it was. On Mount Harum, on the way from Arata, to his death was Banta abandoned. The riches of Arata, Inugi, did not receive. The Mies of Anuki, Arata, did not obtain. In the third region, civilized mankind did not fully blossom.